I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare. Series 1, Chapter 4. Did people really talk like that? A look at Shakespeare's language. Session 1. What is poetry for? Is it verse or prose? And a look at some rhetorical devices rooted in meaning. Did people in Shakespeare's time talk the way his characters do? Yes and no. They didn't need the footnotes we do, because for them, Shakespeare's language was not 400 years old. Words that seem unusual to us were usual to them. Mead, meaning reward. Pard, meaning leopard. Saw, meaning maxim. Zounds, meaning I swear by his, meaning Jesus' wounds. Some words have changed their meaning since Shakespeare's time. Still meant always. Jealous meant suspicious. Stomach meant appetite. On the other hand, Shakespeare invented a lot of words that his own audience had never heard before. They got the meaning, as we do, from the context. Examples include consanguineous in Twelfth Night, fathomless in Troilus and Cressida, and retirement in Henry IV Part I and Henry V. Like the last two examples, most of the words Shakespeare invented we still use today. But the biggest difference between the stage speech and street speech in Shakespeare's day was that the people in his audience did not usually speak in poetry. What is poetry for? The best definition of poetry that I can come up with is this. Poetry says with words what cannot be said in words. Poetry is a medium of getting across an experience of meaning in a way that normal language cannot do. It does so by expressing thought not only through the literal meanings of words, but, as we hinted in Chapter 1, Session 3, through the complex interrelation of the meanings, associations, and sounds of words. In short, through the use of rhetorical devices, sometimes called figures of speech, like metaphor and simile, rhythm and rhyme, antithesis and repetition, and many more. I will be defining and looking more closely at these figures as we go. These devices are not foreign to our daily speech. We often use them unconsciously. Where can I catch the bus to San Diego? Is a five-beat line containing varied rhythm, a visual image called a metaphor, catch, repetition of initial consonants called alliteration, can, catch, repetition of vowel sounds called assonance, can, catch, san, and internal rhyme, can, san. The difference is that the poet uses figures of speech like these elaborately and with intention. Through the complex combination of such rhetorical devices, poetry extends and deepens our responses to the meanings of sentences. Here's an example of how one might express in normal speech an idea from one of Shakespeare's sonnets. The more we trust a friend who seems to merit our trust, the more we are disappointed if he or she later betrays us. This is a clear and familiar idea, and we can all understand it. But unless we are particularly vulnerable to the idea at a given moment, it doesn't move us much. We say true and let it go. But watch what happens when Shakespeare expresses the idea in the verse couplet concluding Sonnet 94. For sweetest things turn sourest by their deeds. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. What's the difference? The second passage creates an entirely different kind of experience in us. We respond to the first version with understanding, but minimal personal engagement or excitement. But in the second version, the words convey more than information. Reading and hearing them, especially after reading the first twelve lines of the sonnet, becomes an intense personal experience. In our response, we empathically smell the sweetness of that lily turned to the foul smell of rot. 
the change of feelings we have when someone betrays our affection or trust has been incarnated, that is, given a body in our mental and emotional experience by evoking in words the physical experience of rotting flowers. We not only think the idea, for a moment we live it. I will be discussing this empathic response in Series 1, Chapter 15 on the nature of art, and we'll look closely at Sonnet 94 in Series 2, Podcast Y. Shakespeare, like all poets, uses the tools of poetry to achieve this heightened personal experience of whatever his subject happens to be. Is it verse or prose? All speeches in Shakespeare are either verse or prose. Verse means the lines have a given metrical length and tightly or loosely fit a particular metrical form, whether or not they rhyme, the way the words of a song fit the rhythm of its music. Prose is what we would call normal, non-metrical speech or writing in paragraph form. The sentences I have just been speaking are in prose, whereas the next three lines, from Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 3, Lines 78 to 80, are in verse. This, above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Until recent times, the conventional way of indicating verse in printing was to set each line of verse as a separate line of print, beginning with a capital letter, and this is true for the works of Shakespeare. Here is the beginning of Hamlet's famous verse soliloquy in Act 3, Scene 1, lines 55 to 59. Since, if you don't have the text in front of you, you can't see the lines on the page, I'll emphasize the meter and line breaks for you. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. By contrast, prose is printed in standard paragraph form. Here is the beginning of Hamlet's prose speech to the players at the beginning of Act 3, Scene 2. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as leaf the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Whether characters are speaking in verse or prose makes a difference in Shakespeare's plays, and therefore the shift from a scene or passage in verse to one in prose, or vice versa, is also significant. In general, verse is used for scenes of greater seriousness, for speakers of higher rank, for formal public speeches, for weighty soliloquies, for romantic exchanges of love, and so on. Prose is generally used for scenes that are more comic, for speakers of lower rank, for informal or intimate exchanges, for lighter soliloquies, for common joking, and so on. But these are not hard and fast rules. There are highly serious moments in prose and lighter scenes in verse. Hamlet's profound, the readiness is all, is in prose. In Romeo and Juliet, Benvolio's line, Supper is done, and we shall come too late, is in verse. The only firm rule is that when Shakespeare switches from prose to verse, or verse to prose, we are intended to notice the contrast with what went before, and the relative direction of the change. A shift from prose to verse will usually move us up the scale of seriousness, weight, formality, rank, poetic intensity. A shift from verse to prose usually means a relaxation toward informality, familiarity, comedy, lower rank, and common speech. So while Shakespeare is not a slave to stylistic formulas, he does build upon his audience's expectations about what kinds of things get said in verse 
and what kinds in prose. That said, even Shakespeare's prose, whether weighty or light, is highly poetical. Here is Hamlet's serious prose speech to the players again. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Notice the use of effective poetical metaphors. Trippingly, mouth it, town crier, saw the air, whirlwind, smoothness. All these phrases intensify our response to the point Hamlet is making. Notice also that no matter how realistically Shakespeare imitates the common prose talk of his day, he also gives it a heightened meaning and intensity. Here's a middle-aged shepherd complaining about teenagers in The Winter's Tale, Act 3, Scene 3, lines 59 to 63. I would there were no age between ten and three and twenty, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancient tree, stealing, fighting. It would take half an hour to point out all the poetic elements in this bit of common speech, which includes hyperbole, meaning exaggeration, a preposition used as a noun, the between, repetition, getting, wronging, stealing, fighting, an adjective turned into a noun, ancientry, repetition of vowel sounds, age, ancientry, three, sleep, between, ancientry, stealing, and so on. The point is that even when writing simple prose, Shakespeare cannot put pen to paper except poetically. Rhetorical devices, figures of speech, schemes, tropes. These phrases refer to techniques or patterns of language that modify, enhance, or intensify the meanings of words. Rhetorical terms have been discussed, debated about, promoted, demoted, and redefined by theorists of language and literature from the ancient Greeks to modern times. As I mentioned in the podcast on Shakespeare the Man, Shakespeare had studied the ancient and contemporary rhetoricians and so had learned about all kinds of rhetorical devices. By the time he began writing, he knew well how to use them. We are not to think of Shakespeare's obviously rhetorical patterning of language, verbal artifice, and wordplay as merely decoration. It is the very medium of thought and feeling, especially intense feeling. As Shakespeare matured, his use of figures of speech became more and more subtle, rhetoric and meaning more absorbed into one another. But from the Renaissance viewpoint, even in the highly figured speech of earlier plays, for example, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Richard II, and Romeo and Juliet, the use of formal rhetorical devices does not obscure the speaker's passion, but rather expresses it. We will not delve too deeply into the study of rhetorical terms, but in order to appreciate Shakespeare's poetic accomplishment, we will need to identify a few of the major ones. Others will be identified as needed in the discussions of particular passages. Those who might be interested in a long list of figures of speech with illustrations of them from Shakespeare's work are invited to email me at the address below. If there is interest, I will devote a podcast to the subject. For convenience, we'll distinguish the devices rooted in meaning, like metaphor and simile, those rooted in sound, like meter, rhythm, and rhyme, and those rooted in structure or arrangement, like antithesis and repetition, always remembering that one of the signs of a great poet is his ability to unite meaning, sound, and structure into a single indivisible experience. Let's begin with rhetorical devices rooted in meaning. In Shakespeare, the most important rhetorical device rooted in the meanings of words is imagery, 
words that call images of things into the mind in order to convey meaning. We use imagery all the time. When someone responds to a request by saying no, there is no use of imagery. But if instead a person were to say, over my dead body, or when hell freezes over, or in your dreams, or don't hold your breath, he or she is using imagery. Depending on which image is chosen, we get a somewhat different empathic response. Don't hold your breath is not nearly so drastic a denial as over my dead body, because if one is alive, one can decide to start breathing again. The fundamental tool for producing imagery is the metaphor. A metaphor uses a word denoting something, usually physical, to evoke a strong empathic response to something usually not in itself physical. Every metaphor is a word or phrase denoting a thing that carries a meaning. Literature professors call the meaning carried the tenor, and the thing that carries it the vehicle. For example, in Don't Hold Your Breath, the image of a person holding his breath is the vehicle, carrying the meaning, and the tenor or meaning is a short time. Its negation by the word don't stresses the opposite idea. So don't hold your breath carries the meaning not soon or never. Let's take a more complex example. Here again is the beginning of Hamlet's soliloquy in Act 3, Scene 1. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and, by opposing, end them. Notice Hamlet's phrase, sea of troubles. Troubles is an abstract idea, naming anything that might cause discomfort or suffering. Watching the play, we know what particular troubles Hamlet is suffering from. But in this speech, he is generalizing about all men. So how does Shakespeare get us to feel the weight of all those potential troubles? He uses an image from an entirely different realm of our experience, not emotional pain, but physical sensation. The sea is big, powerful, uncontrollable, strange, and potentially deadly. When we hear sea of troubles, we know, we feel exactly what Hamlet means. Troubles so many and various and uncontrollable that to suffer from them feels like being overwhelmed by the sea, which is far greater than we are and could easily finish us. Shakespeare was probably also implying in the word sea the specific nautical sense of a huge wave that washes over a ship. The effect of both senses is similar. But there is more to the image. Shakespeare has given us what's called a mixed metaphor. Hamlet says, to take arms against a sea of troubles. Normally we don't think of taking arms, in Shakespeare's time wielding a sword or bow and arrows or maybe a pistol, against the sea or a huge wave of the sea. Can one defeat water with a sword or a gun? Why has Shakespeare joined these inappropriate images? Because while a sword is useless against the sea, one can perhaps defeat one's troubles with a sword, or can one? It depends on the troubles. And what would it say about someone that he chose to face the sea with a sword, despite the futility of doing so? The metaphor embodies in itself the whole dilemma in Hamlet's mind at this point in the play. The idea of man's smallness helplessness, and frustration in the face of his troubles, the desire to respond to them nobly, and the awareness that any response may be both heroic and futile. An effective metaphor incarnates meaning in our experience, making it real to us. A second tool, the simile, works in the same way. A simile is a metaphor that makes the relation between the tenor, the meaning, and the vehicle, what carries the meaning, obvious by using the comparison words like and as. When, in the beginning of Act 2, Scene 2, Romeo says, But soft, 
what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. He is speaking in metaphors. The light in the window is the light of the sunrise in the east. Juliet is the sun. When, twenty-five lines later, he says, Thou art as glorious to this night, being o'er my head, as is a winged messenger of heaven, he is speaking in a simile. You are not exactly an angel, but as glorious as an angel. Whether the poet uses metaphor or simile, the effect is to get us to experience the meaning of one thing under the image of another. To Romeo, Juliet is bright, light-giving, exalted, angelic, standing literally above him on the balcony, and perhaps unattainable. And we know how he feels about her, because we ourselves have looked up, seen the sun, imagined angels, yearned for unattainable brightness, and perhaps been in love and felt this way about our own beloved. In the next sessions two and three, we'll look at rhetorical devices rooted in sound. Session four will be devoted to the subject of variation in speech, and we'll sum up by asking whether Shakespeare's audience got it all. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.